Good evening everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and I'd like to welcome you to the sixth webinar in our 2016 Musculoskeletal Health webinar series and the second webinar as Move Muscle Bone and Joint Health, the new dynamic voice of Arthritis and Osteoporosis Victoria. Move's purpose is to improve the quality of life of people who have or are at risk of developing muscle bone and joint conditions. This evening's webinar is on the topic of exercise as medicine, musculoskeletal health. Before introducing our presenter for this evening, however, I just have a couple of housekeeping issues to run through. Firstly, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please refer to the chat box on your screen. You can type a message at any time that will be read by the webinar organiser at Redback Conferencing. If you are listening via the phone, you will notice a small time delay between the audio and the screen. This is normal, so don't be concerned. Also, whilst our presenter will answer questions after the completion of her presentation, you can actually type questions for her at any time. Can I suggest that you don't leave your questions to the last minute, as we will aim to finish no later than 8pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. I would also be very grateful to participants if you could take a moment at the end of the webinar to complete the exit survey. It should only take you a moment to complete. Our presenter for tonight is Associate Professor Melanie Cameron. Laney is an osteopath and accredited exercise physiologist and is currently working as the program leader of the Bachelor of Clinical Exercise Science at the University of the Sunshine Coast. She is interested in exercise as medicine for musculoskeletal conditions, particularly chronic and complex conditions such as the arthritis. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Laney. Thanks very much, Laney. Good, be good evening. Thanks, Jen. I, I am Lainey Cameron, MOVE, formerly known as Arthritis and Osteoporosis Victoria, approached Exercise and Sports Science Australia, seeking an exercise physiologist to lead a webinar on exercise for people with arthritis. My name got thrown into the mix because I'm both an exercise physiologist and an osteopath. My mother had progressive systemic sclerosis, otherwise known as scleroderma. She died when I was 28, not long after I commenced a PhD exploring both manual therapies and exercise interventions for people with rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. Partway through my PhD, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. So I'm speaking with you this evening both as a scientist and an academic, and also as a person who lives with the challenges of an arthritic disease and has felt some of those costs rather deeply. My plan for this webinar is to clarify a little bit about your background because I don't want to teach you to suck eggs. Then I'm going to recap the Australian National Guidelines for Physical Activity, introduce you to a resource to screen and stratify clients for exercise, and cover some practical ways for determining exercise intensity. Then we'll look at the key components of any exercise prescription. Once we have those frameworks in place, we'll spend most of our time looking, about, looking at how we can apply them for people with the arthritis. If we have some time at the end, then I'll bust a few myths currently abounding in the exercise and fitness industries. I'm happy for you to ask questions at any stage. I'll go through my presentation first, and then if I haven't answered your questions along the way, I'll come back and cover them at the end. I will promise that if I can't answer your question, I will just say so. I'm definitely not the oracle. I'm not aware of the background of everyone online tonight. I've pitched this webinar at clinicians, so I'm going to assume that everyone listening has at least some substantial study under their belt. And I'm going to assume that you know something about the arthritic diseases. You might even work with clients with arthritis on a daily basis. So I'm not going to revise the various forms of arthritis. Instead, I've chosen to focus on exercise, which may not have been a substantial component of your study. Most healthcare practitioners have been sold some messages that exercise is good for health. We know that it's better to be active than inactive, that regular exercise reduces the risk of a whole bunch of diseases of lifestyle. We might also have experience of a particular exercise or sport, you may have found great joy in some types of movement. I want to say that all of this experience and understanding is important and helpful. Because we all move, 
it's easy to assume that we all know about exercise. But this isn't actually true. In the same way that we all eat, but we're not all dietitians, equipped and skilled to give specialist food advice to ill people, we all move, but we're not all exercise experts. It's my hope that by the end of this webinar, you will feel a little more confident to give exercise advice to your patients. You'll also be able to spot poor or incomplete exercise advice. And even more importantly, you will have at your fingertips other clinicians as resources to direct those patients who really do need specialised input. So how much exercise is enough? Let's take a look at the National Physical Activity Guidelines for Australia. Did you know we had some? If you're thinking that the recommendation is 30 minutes three times a week, you're about two decades out of date. If you're thinking that the recommendation is 30 minutes five days a week, then you're still a few years out of date, although those recommendations remain for the World Health Organisation and most modern economies. Australia extended its guidelines back in 2014. We currently recommend that Australian adults partake in 300 minutes of moderately vigorous physical activity or 150 minutes of vigorous activity or a combination of those types of activities per week. We specifically recommend that two sessions per week include some exercise to build or maintain muscle strength. You can see the flexibility in the guidelines. If you do more vigorous exercise, then you don't need to do so much of it. And you can do different types of exercise across the week to meet the requirements. We have similar guidelines for teenagers, children, and older adults. There are sedentary behaviour guidelines too that recommend caps on screen time, particularly screen time for entertainment in children and teenagers. I've provided the link here for you to take here to take you to the Australian government website to download all of the document guidelines as PDF brochures. So to guide me, let's stop for a moment and take stock. What are your own exercise habits? Are they the same every day, every week? How confident are you that you would stick to your exercise routine during illness? or if you were feeling pain, or if there are other demands on your time, such as work or family pressures. These challenges arise for all of us. For those of us who are able-bodied, apparently healthy and well-informed about the value and importance of exercise, it's difficult. Imagine how much tougher it might be for our patients with arthritic diseases. One of the resources I've provided for you is a book chapter on Bandura's self-efficacy scales. Self-efficacy is, of course, task-specific self-confidence. Bandura's scale is useful in that it can be adapted to a wide variety of personal circumstances, including self-efficacy to start exercise or persist with exercise under duress. I find this scale a useful tool for framing discussions with clients about their goals and barriers to exercise. A challenging situation that can arise for healthcare practitioners is when our patients try to join a, a public gym or a community exercise facility. I'm not criticising these facilities. They, are, they provide an important community service for apparently healthy people to be active and achieve the national guidelines that we just discussed. However, like many modern businesses, gyms and exercise centres want to minimise both their risks and their costs. And one of the ways that they do this is to direct new customers who have health conditions to get clearance from their doctor or another clinician before joining the club. If we accept that most medical practitioners and many other clinicians, knowledgeable as they are about diseases and clinical conditions, are not fully versed in exercise prescription or the risks and benefits of exercise, then this direction to seek clearance is simply an attempt to pass the risks associated with exercise off from the gym onto someone else. Are you ready to carry the risks of someone else's exercise behaviour? Do you know enough to give your patient sound exercise advice? And if you don't, do you know from whom you and your patient could seek that kind of advice? 
Now, not all gyms and community centres are simply avoiding the issue. Fitness Australia, one of the representative groups for the fitness industry, joined forces with Exercise and Sports Science Australia and Sports Medicine Australia to develop an exercise pre-screening tool for Australian adults. It's worth taking a look at in some depth. I hope you'll find it a useful tool, and even if you don't use it yourself, it may help you to guide and redirect those patients who pepper you with questions before they start exercising. Again, I've provided the links for you through to the PDF document and the associated user's manual. These documents are public domain materials. The first edition, uh, the, sorry, the first section of the document is a single page for people, any Australian adults, to fill in by themselves about themselves. No special training is required. It's a single page, seven questions, tended to determine whether there are, there are any health conditions that might need to be checked out. Of course, like all self-reports, patients can lie or they can downplay their own condition. So the recommendations based on this section are deliberately conservative. And of course, seven screening questions does not make for a full clinical history. So it is possible that people with existing health conditions would be screened in as able to exercise alone at up to moderate intensity in a public facility without supervision. You see, if you answer no to all of the seven questions, then you're advised without further investigation that you can participate in light to moderate physical intensity, physical activity of whichever type you prefer. If you answer yes to any item, then the recommendation is that you seek further advice from a healthcare practitioner which of course might take us back to the earlier problem if that healthcare practitioner is not really an exercise expert. I hope you can see that the intensity of exercise is a key factor in determining exercise risk. Generally, higher exercise intensity means riskier exercise rather than lower exercise intensity. So it at the same time, greater intensity of exercise is one of the ways that we can reduce the time commitment required for exercise. And it's a principal selling point for high, interval, high intensity interval training, otherwise known as HIT. Further, there's evidence that high intensity exercise returns some additional health benefits. So there are good reasons for people to want to be involved in more vigorous activity. Let's take a moment to look at exercise intensity. In scientific studies, we tend to use the Borg rating of perceived exertion to ask participants to quantify how hard they feel they're working. The scale is generally considered to run from 6 to 20, considering that intensities from 0 to 5 would account for people who are comatose through to bedbound. So in this slide, I've captured for you both the Borg scale on the left-hand side and some colloquial descriptions of the scale to explain meaning to participants on the right-hand side. Because the 6 to 20 scale is not intuitively comprehensible, we tend to use a 0 to 10 scale for practical work with patients. Generally, the 0 to 10 scale is considered to lack some of the precision of the scale with more graduations, but it seems to be good enough for clinical purposes. The first category I want you to focus on are the green bands. Three to four, somewhat hard. This level corresponds to moderately vigorous exercise. This is the stuff we need for, 30, for 300 minutes a week if we work only at this level. Then take a look at the yellow bands, five to six, the hard level. This corresponds to vigorous intensity exercise. We need 150 minutes of exercise per week if we work at this level. Levels from seven and above correspond to high intensity exercise. This is the intensity at which you would work in a HIIT program or when doing something like CrossFit. Another useful thing in the exercise pre-screening tool is the linking of this scale, the zero to 10 scale, to a percentage of maximum heart rate and the descriptions of the effect of the activity on respiration, communication, and the likelihood of being able to continue the activity. So let's consider for a moment the patient who comes to you saying that they have a clinical condition 
and would like you to assess them before they start an exercise program. The screening tool includes a note that stage two and stage three are to be administered by a qualified, qualified exercise professional. That would usually mean an exercise physiologist but it could mean another healthcare practitioner with a focus on exercise, such as a physiotherapist, a sports dietitian, a sports medicine doctor. The particular professional qualification isn't so important, I think, so much as the combination of clinical skills to administer the questionnaire and the knowledge and confidence to prescribe relevant exercise. But I would suggest that two practitioners could work together to administer these latter sections of the questionnaire. For example, a nurse or an occupational therapist or a general medical practitioner could administer parts two and three of the screening tool, which asks for things like waist circumference and um, type two diabetes measures and uh, cholesterol measures, but not necessarily feel informed or confident to prescribe exercise and instead might need to make a referral to an exercise physiologist to follow through on specific relevant exercise prescription. Again, the recommendations from the screening tool around suitable in, are around suitable intensities of exercise relative to the inherent risk posed by concurrent clinical conditions. The screening tool itself doesn't give you an exercise prescription. Now, you'll have heard me talk about exercise prescription. What's in an exercise prescription? In the same way that there can be good and poor prescriptions for medication, there can be good and poor prescriptions for exercise. If I tell you to take your vitamin B for peripheral neuropathy, but I don't tell you how much to take, when to take it, and the form in which to take it, then you may well take too much, take too little, take it in a form you can't absorb, spend too much money on it, take more than you really need. That's half-baked clinical care. If we won't stand for that sort of half-baked clinical care in medication prescription, then we shouldn't put up with it or deliver it in exercise prescription either. Excuse me. Exercise is medicine after all, but to get the prescription right, you need to know the frequency, intensity, timing and type of exercise. If a patient comes to you saying that they're starting an exercise program, you could ask them to relay to you these four aspects of the program. How often, how much, when, and what. If they can't tell you the frequency, intensity, timing, and type of their exercise, then they don't have a full grasp on their prescription. In the same way that medication prescriptions can be tailored to suit individuals, there are a whole lot of factors, many of them quite personal, that exercise practitioners take into account when prescribing exercise. For example, I never prescribe exercises that people have told me they don't like. If you say, I hate running, then I'm never, ever going to make you run. If I do, you'll hate me, and you won't stick to your exercises for very long either, probably only long enough to run away from me. Instead, I will be creative. I will find other ways to achieve the same outcomes as running without making you run. I might raise your heart rate and respiratory rate with some dancing, bushwalking, cycling, rowing, fast walking. In fact, the creativity of exercise physiology is one of the things I truly love about my job. So what data do we have on exercise for people with arthritis? Quite a lot, actually. So Hoven and colleagues recently published a nice summary review of the current state of our knowledge on physical activity and rheumatoid arthritis. I've included a copy of the full paper in your webinar pack of notes. Their review was quite systematic, but it lacked meta-analyses because the studies were dissimilar and comparisons were difficult to make. Regardless, some of the studies were large and of high quality, and they should be taken seriously key messages from this review are that most people with rheumatoid arthritis do not do enough physical activity to meet even the international guidelines, let alone the more substantial Australian guidelines. Inactivity is associated with increased disease risk, more fatigue, sarcopenia, 
more hospital admissions and higher costs of treatment. Of course, not all the directions of association are clear. Are people with rheumatoid arthritis less active because they are fatigued or are they fatigued because they're less active? Regardless, we know that inactivity is a marker of worse and more costly disease. Physical activity reduces risk of severe disease. Again, the precise nature of that relationship is not always clear, but we have enough data now to say for sure that people with rheumatoid arthritis who are physically active at international guideline levels do experience less severe disease. In statistical terms, the relative risk of DAS 28 scores greater than 5.1 is 1.65 in patients who are inactive. Put more simply, you have a much greater chance, 165% greater chance of severe disease if you do less exercise. There also seems to be a protective effect from regular physical activity prior to rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis although the nature of that association needs a lot more exploration. There's been a couple of studies on flow-mediated dilatation as an early sign of cardiovascular disease, which we know can have early onset in people with RA. And those studies showed improvements in that measure in people who did regular aerobic exercise. One study used a protocol of 15-minute bouts vigorous physical activity twice a week and demonstrated a dose-dependent relationship between that activity and vascular function. We've long accepted that aerobic exercise is good for your heart and vessels, but we now have some evidence that even in people with other diseases, this effect on vascular health is preserved. Jogging is worth a special mention here. Jogging is one of those activities that tends to get a bad reputation for people with joint pain. But there's now reasonable evidence from meta-analysis of 14 trials, including more than 1,000 patients, that aerobic exercise, including jogging for up to five times per week for 60 minutes at a time, reduces pain, improves function, and actually decreases structural joint damage expected in rheumatoid arthritis. And it doesn't seem to worsen disease activity if you score it using the DAS-28 nor increase swollen or tender joint counts. So as my rheumatologist put it, if you're running less than 50 kilometres a week, you're probably not doing your joints any harm. Resistance and weight-bearing exercises are also worth a special mention. Evidence around these types of exercises in rheumatoid arthritis is growing. The studies are generally smaller, but they're well designed and they've been continued over a couple of years. The results seem to indicate that resistance exercises, that is strength training for up to 30 minutes per session, up to three times a week, does not compromise joint structure in people with rheumatoid arthritis unless erosions already exist in the involved joints. Further, we know that resistance exercises are beneficial for bone health. The evidence in people with rheumatoid arthritis that regularly engaging in resistance exercise has a small effect on improving bone mineral density. Now, this small effect doesn't appear to be statistically significant, but of course, it's difficult to show statistical significance in small studies because a type two error is likely. I'd suggest to you that this small effect is probably still clinically significant because the natural history of rheumatoid arthritis is that osteopenia associated with that disease worsens over time rather than improves. So even a tiny improvement over a two-year trial is probably something to cheer about. And I hope, unsurprising for you, but quite surprising for patients often, regular exercise in rheumatoid arthritis has been demonstrated to reduce pain, fatigue and depression and increase quality of life. Patients are often quite surprised to discover that they feel less fatigued and hurt less when they're actually doing more. There are some key barriers to vigorous aerobic exercise and strength training among people with rheumatoid arthritis. And one of the biggest barriers is us. We are fearful that patients will end up with highly deformed joints. So we caution them to be careful, to do less, 
to protect their joints. For decades now, we have given patients advice like we see on this slide. These images come from a joint protection brochure for people with rheumatoid arthritis produced by the Mayo Clinic. Joint protection comprises avoiding joint movements that are particularly painful, that place mechanical stress on joints and that render joints vulnerable to injury. Gait aids such as walking sticks and orthotic devices such as splints may also be used to prevent loading of joints. Joint protection is intuitively logical therapy. If a joint can be protected from mechanical stress and therefore from inflammation, that joint is less likely to deteriorate. But remember that joint protection is also an illness behaviour. The use of these highly visible aids and different ways of doing things labels a person as ill. Back in 1999, Hammond, Lincoln and Sutcliffe conducted a crossover trial comparing two education programs of joint protection. The results indicated that adherence to joint protection strategies was greater following one educational strategy than the other. But no significant physical or psychological improvements were identified at any point post-intervention. If measures of pain, functional disability, grip strength, self-efficacy and helplessness don't alter significantly from the pre-intervention state, then perhaps it's not important how joint protection is taught. Maybe it's important whether it's taught. And when the sick role is publicly visible, as it often is in joint protection, then at least two possible reactions may follow. Some people might abhor the idea of being seen as sick and reject the sick role outright, deny any benefits that the sick role has to offer and continue to engage in activities that do worsen their health. Persistence with health damaging behaviours is not actually a likely explanation of the findings of Hammond and colleagues because they did measure adherence and they found that people stuck to the joint protection program and that indeed it was increased when educational strategies were employed. Other people enjoy the benefits of a visible sick role and may favour the sick role in order to reap such benefits. For example, having a walking stick might actually result in getting preferential treatment in public places, uh, in shopping queues for example. Now the adoption of the sick role is not usually a deliberate manipulation to seek benefit. Rather, when the secondary gains arise from the sick role, the client's motivation to adopt the sick role increases. Similarly, family and friends, concerned loved ones leap to assistance and they take on unpleasant duties that might usually be done by that person. And that behaviour affords a secondary gain to the sick role and decreases the likelihood of relinquishing that role. Possibly, Hammond and colleagues' investigation of joint protection showed no observable benefits because the joint protection programs emphasised the sick role and lessened total physical activity and they might be compromised by secondary gain. It's important to recognise that the management of rheumatoid arthritis has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. The COX-2 enzyme was only identified in 1988. COX-2 inhibitors first came onto the market in 1999. That's very rapid drug development. Of course, in 2000, Viox was withdrawn from the, uh, 2004, Viox was withdrawn from the market. At that stage, COX-2 inhibitors and the other non-steroidals were mainstay first-line treatment for rheumatoid arthritis in people who didn't have joint erosions. DMARDs and the new, the then brand new biologics were reserved for people with advanced and uncontrolled disease. Now, the way that we approach treatment has changed. Patients are given a single DMARD as early as possible. In the words of my own rheumatologist, if you need an anti-inflammatory daily, then we now know that you're better off on a DMARD. We now give people without joint lesions, early in the course of their disease, or with only moderately active disease, DMARD monotherapy, usually Plaquenil or Methotrexate, we use biologic agents earlier and we use the combination of these newer drugs and we give them 
Giving them earlier in the course of disease means that we see far fewer people with joint erosions and joint deformity. Of course, there are patients who avoid doctors, who avoid specialists and who don't take medication as recommended. And there are patients who have really persistent disease that progresses even when they have substantial drug treatment. But the point still stands. We see a lot less joint erosion and a lot less deformity now than we did even a decade ago. So using myself as an example, let's have a look at what we could, how we could apply what we've now covered about exercise to someone with rheumatoid arthritis. This is me. I'm 44. I'm employed full time in a largely sedentary job. I have rheumatoid arthritis. I consider myself blessed that I have seronegative disease, but I have had symptoms for a long time and multiple joints are affected. For a long time, I stuck to the older, more conservative management guidelines using analgesics and non-steroidals as required, but my joint swelling became persistent and the American College of Rheumatology released updated management guidelines, which I discussed with my GP and we decided that it was probably time for me to see a rheumatologist again and consider commencing on a DMARD. So off to the rheumatologist I went. I started on Plaquenil, which has seemed to be tolerating really well. The swelling in my small joints gradually decreased. At the three month checkup, I still had persistent swelling in my left knee. My usual rheumatologist was away. The locum, suggested that a couple of vials of corticosteroid into my left knee would help speed up the reduction, help speed up reducing the swelling in that joint, so I agreed. After the injection, she said, no serious exercise for the next three days. So I'd ask you, what does that really mean? Here's what my exercise usually looks like. I exercise daily, but I'm not rigid about the program. I vary the intensity of my exercise from light through to vigorous. I rarely exercise in the mornings because that's when my joints are most stiff and painful. I like lots of different types of exercise. I've listed here for you types by their intended purpose as well as by their name. So I want you to see that even with a long history of rheumatoid arthritis, there's a lot of exercise that I can do. I lift in gloves. I use gloves for boxing. I pay attention to my form during weightlifting and horse riding. I don't spar boxing with others or engage in combat sports. And in those ways, I do practice joint protection. I don't actually play any team sports at the moment, but I have played netball and volleyball and badminton. There is more that I can do than I can't. So when I asked my rheumatologist what she really meant by no heavy exercise for three days, she simply said, no running. What I then did mentally was to look at my usual exercise, identify everything that I do that has comparable intensity to running and avoid that for the three days following the injection into my knee. And that made my exercise prescription look like this. Of course, most patients don't do those sorts of mental calculations around their own exercise prescription. So I encourage you to give them more content. Give them details of frequency, intensity, timing and type whenever you can. And remember that it is intensity that largely contributes to risk. If you need to reduce risk, reduce intensity. Now that's exactly what the locum rheumatologist was saying. She just didn't say it in the language of exercise prescription. Here's another complex example for you to consider. Peter's a patient of mine and he's given me permission to share his story. Peter is a 59 year old man retired from the army. He was a chef by trade. He's had pancreatic cancer and following a Whipple's procedure to remove the head of his pancreas as well as his gallbladder, common bile duct, duodenum and in his case part of his stomach, Peter's doctors say he's doing well. That is, he has no evidence of cancer at the moment. He's one of the small percentage of people who survived a pancreatic 
cancer diagnosis by beyond five years. Because of the extensive nature of the surgery, Peter is probably not absorbing fats and vitamin D so well anymore. He has developed a secondary osteopenia, so he takes substantial calcium. He has a kyphotic, sorry, he takes supplemental calcium. He has a kyphotic posture, but no evidence of osteoporotic fractures at this stage. He's lost weight, and his body mass index seems to have stabilized at about 19. He's generally deconditioned. Peter has a good relationship with a supportive GP, and she put together an allied care team, allied health care team, for an extended care plan involving some changes to Peter's diet and some exercise intervention. Here's a summary of my exercise prescription for Peter. Regarding frequency, I, I asked him to exercise daily. I prepared a structured timetable for him. He liked that approach. It was consistent with his experience of routine in the army. When considering intensity, I asked Peter to work at a moderate intensity. I wanted him to huff and puff a bit to work at, a, at an RPE of about three or four out of 10. Peter had not been sleeping well. He was sluggish in the mornings and he was concerned about falling during exercise. I planned my recommendations around the timing of exercise to address these concerns. We scheduled exercise sessions for 20 to 60 minutes in the afternoon during daylight when another person could be with him. Exercise types could be broadly classed as aerobic, that is walking and hydrotherapy, strength training, uh, that is exercises to work against resistance, and functional activities. In Peter's case, getting outdoors to have fun with his family by going to beaches and parks and on shopping trips. Let's look a little bit more at the strengthening exercises. Of course, these are the exercise type that would be most important for slowing Peter's osteopenia. One of the first exercises I got Peter to do as part of his home program was a sit to stand from a chair. Initially, he did this as a set of six, working against the resistance of only his own body mass under gravity. He didn't seem to, he didn't need me to be present every time he did these exercises at home, but he did need to have someone around for his own sense of security and to have a firm support to grab onto if he felt unstable during the exercise. Over time, we progressed these exercises through to more repetitions, then to greater depth as wall squats with a Swiss ball, and then progressed to freestanding body weight squats through full range, and then added load in the form of free weights. Eventually, progression for Peter could, could include adding a jump into his squats or a barbell across his shoulders. One of the things to point out here is that Exercise dose can be modulated in comparable ways to modulating drug doses. We can give medication with food to delay absorption. We can cut pills in half to divide doses. We can give them with other pills to counter side effects. Similarly, we can plan exercise for times of the day when the patient feels most, most energetic or when they hurt least. We can take a single simple exercise such as a squat and have many variations of it to make it easy enough for any patient to do or challenging enough for any patient to progress. I'd like to stop there for a moment and just ask, has that been helpful for you? I'm nearly at the end of what I had planned to say, so please let me know if there's anything else you would like me to cover or go into in more detail. Now, the exercise world is full of fads and fashions. I've thrown this slide in to remind me to talk with you about a few of them. None of these fads are specifically targeted at people with arthritis, but neither are your patients immune to publicity. On the right of the screen, we see a woman using a Pilates reformer. Pilates is a strength-based exercise system focused on controlled movement through specific ranges. Doing Pilates will increase muscle strength, particularly the component of strength that we call endurance. In that regard, it does what it claims to do. 
My criticisms of Pilates are few, but the classes can be expensive. Reformer equipment is usually only available in studios, not the sort of thing that patients have at home. And in the case of reformer work, the movements are predominantly linear. Life doesn't happen in straight lines all the time. Next across the screen is a summary of a high intensity interval training or HIT workout. Accepting, that what, accepting what we've already covered, then that high intensity exercise does return some benefits over lower intensity exercise, but also carries greater risk. My criticism of this program is that it floats around on the internet available to anyone without any caveats. There's no warm up, no cool down, no guidelines around its use. Build as the 15 minute workout, but if you did it straight through as listed, it would take 640 seconds just over 10 minutes. It also might make you vomit. There is a place for HIT, but it is within the context of a broader understanding of why exercise is prescribed and what it is expected to achieve. Then on the right of the screen, we have a couple of famous faces of the fitness industry. Michelle Bridges at the top of the screen and Tracy Anderson at the bottom. Both of these women get a lot of traction with patients because they are famous and they have amazing marketing behind them. They also both promote changing your body and changing your life. They're almost evangelical in their promotion of their approaches to exercise. My critique of Michelle Bridges is complex and muted because her advice is not all bad. It is, however, pitched at the masses, backed by the need of a large retailer to sell products and not tailored to patients' personal needs. Tracy Anderson is more concerning because a whole bunch of her advice is just wrong. She's dismissed kettlebells as dangerous, they're those scary looking things at the top of the screen, recommends not working large muscle groups and suggests that women will get bulky and then plateau if they lift weights, and so advocates lifting tiny weights through small ranges of movement to exercise accessory muscles in isolation. Tracy Anderson seems to have completely forgotten that you have large powerful muscles for a reason to do the bulk of the work of living. As for the kettlebells at the top, they're just weights with a funny handle on them. Like any tool, they can be used poorly or well. So my takeaways are these. Exercise is good for us. Most of us don't do enough of it. People with arthritis tend to do even less but could benefit from doing more. They can probably do more than you think they can without doing their joints any harm. You can help by encouraging your patients to exercise rather than encouraging them to be inactive. Inactively, inactivity leads to a raft of health complications including generally worsening arthritis. If you're going to recommend strategies such as joint protection or use of aids, please do so in the context of these approaches allowing patients to become more active, not less so. For example, a person with osteoarthritis in the knees is better served by the provision of a set of Nordic walking poles and encouragement to keep walking rather than by reducing his or her walking. When making exercise recommendations, be sure you can cover frequency, intensity, timing and type. To cover this ground, you need to know the purpose of an exercise, that is, why it is recommended and why it is likely to do what you expect it to do. Don't have this knowledge and you can't cover the fit ground, fitness, frequency, intensity, timing and type, you probably shouldn't be prescribing exercise. So get some help. I could go on for a long time about how to make actual exercise recommendations for real people but I can't be the exercise advisor for the whole of the online world, so I suggest that you get to know the exercise prescribers in your area. Listen for fit when they tell you how they prescribe exercise for your patients and choose your referrals wisely. Are there any questions?
Thanks. Thanks very much, Lenny. That was a very interesting and important presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, could I encourage you to type them into the message box now? I've actually got a couple of questions myself, Lenny. Um, just in relation, you talked about the patient Peter and how you modified his his exercise prescription um, based on. Um, uh, you know what was required. Just out of interest, does does the process to actually um, design that exercise um, prescription? Do you have a, a series of particular questions you will ask your 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 patients, um, or how do you how do you actually go about that process to determine um, what what is required within that exercise prescription? Sure. Look, a, a consultation with an exercise physiologist. Uh, really has similarities to a consultation with any other healthcare practitioner and it begins with, with a clinical conversation. So the first thing I do is get to know the patient. Uh, what it is that they're seeking, what's important to them, their clinical history, uh, their relevant family history, their surgical history uh, and what it is they want to achieve. I ask specifically about their goals in exercise and their barriers in exercise. What is it they want to do? And then I try and convert their goals into something physiological. So, you know, a client might say, uh, I want to play with my grandchildren. I want to be able to go to the park and play on the, on the equipment with my grandchildren. I then will convert that mentally into something physiological. Uh, that may be increasing range of movement at joints, uh, increasing ability to climb stairs, and, and then I'll plan exercise to achieve those physiological goals. But it all starts from what the patient wants to be able to achieve. And, yes. and I'll then factor into that what it is they don't want barriers to exercise. Mm. That's um, that's that's very good to uh, you know start with their sort of uh, expectations and aspirations and goals. Um, uh, another sort of thing that came to mind you mentioned about sort of um, with the studies about uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis and how um, you know actually more physical activity would be better for their total sort of um, their their condition and the, and their quality of life. But how do you actually go about, I mean, what are some of the techniques about convincing patients of this? Because um, if people are experiencing a bit of pain, uh, it, it may take some, some effort to actually convince them that to actually move more uh, will be better for them. So any hints in that way? Sure. In fact, if you go and look at the paper by Verhoeven and colleagues, uh, they identify two principal barriers to, to patients with rheumatoid arthritis not doing enough exercise. One is the patients themselves and the other is the practitioners. So tonight I've tried to focus on the practitioners and how we get in the way, but, but you're absolutely right that patients themselves also find this really challenging. Uh, and so I find that it is a, a, a kind of um, drip filtering uh, of um, that that process over time. So it might start with, uh, if, the, if the patient says their goal is to have less pain in a particular joint, then we might focus in on pain as something that we're going to measure and I'll actually get them to repeatedly measure pain over the course of their exercise. And they may well be able to see that their pain decreases. Um, often change in pain takes quite a long time and so I will also point out to clients along the way that their function is improving as well. So even if their pain is steady, their function may be improving and that's also a really useful benefit from exercise. So I'll, I'll feed back information about themselves to clients as they, as they make progress. And that then becomes useful for um, transferring uh, that ownership of why exercise matters. And I will have conversations along the way about um, what 
what matters to them in exercise. The, what we know from exercise behaviour change is that we move from that action stage of behaviour change where we're just doing the thing to maintaining doing the thing of our own volition. Right? Um, we make that shift when we have personal value and importance in the activity. So I will have those conversations that help the client get to why this matters to them. Um, to go back and use me as, as a case example, um, one of the primary reasons I exercise is so that I can sleep. Um, if I don't exercise regularly, I really notice a change in the quality of my sleep and the quality of my sleep then affects the quality of everything else, including that I feel more joint pain, but also I'm just grumpier and I'm less able to cope with all of the things of life. And so for me now, exercising regularly is because actually I really like a good night's sleep. I think um, I think exercise uh, helping with grumpiness applies to um, more than just you, Lainey. Um, we have a question that's come through uh, just in relation to someone who came, joined the presentation a little bit later, just asking a question, did you talk about the economics of cost effectiveness of an exercise referral compared to um, the use of medications? You didn't actually cover that, but what no. would you like to say in response to that question? Look, I haven't presented any data on that issue, uh, but it is an important issue that one of the things that um, we do see when clients become or patients become regular exercisers and regularly active is that we do see reductions in cost of care. Um, and that is not only cost of medications because, you know, Medications in, in, well, particularly rheumatoid arthritis are often regular doses used over a long time. Um, so it's really long-term data we have to gather to see changes in, in those costs. We see fewer hospital admissions. And, and cost of care is dramatically less if people don't end up in hospital. Australian hospitals, it costs about $800 a day to have you in an Australian hospital and that's before we start sending specialists to see you and start running bucket loads of tests on you. Just, you know, to have staff attend to you, keep you in a bed and give you meals and, and service you as a human being in a hospital costs us about $800 a day. If we can keep you out of there, we're saving lots of money. Okay, if there's no further questions coming through, I might wrap it up there. I must say, um, you know, a couple of other points you made that I thought were really important was about the, the creativity of exercise prescription. I think that's really important for everyone to remember that if, if something doesn't appeal to a patient or is, is not quite appropriate, there are so many other options. So I think that's a great message to take away from tonight's presentation and what you also commented on with regards to the sick role um, and, and sometimes people's reliance in actually as you talked about the secondary benefits I thought that was also really interesting. So Lainey, um, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who has joined us uh, for the webinar this evening. Could I remind you to uh, take a moment when we go off screen to complete the exit survey um, and I hope that you will tune in for our next webinar which will be about client adherence to treatment and, and what you can do to assist that. That will be screened on Tuesday the 23rd of August so hopefully um, you will uh, find that topic to be of great relevance as well. So on that note Lainey, many thanks and good evening and to all our participants, good evening to you all as well. Thank you. Thank you.